Hello. Welcome to the American Oil Chemist Society 2021 annual meeting e-poster pitch competition for the Lipid Oxidation and Quality Division. In this next session, we will have six students who will be presenting their posters, which are also available. Uh, the posters themselves are available through the AOCS meeting website. Those of you who are watching will be given a chance to vote for these uh, presentations. There's a matrix with which you can decide on different aspects of the presentation. And the voting will take place in two pieces. So we'll have two groups. There'll be three students that will present. The option to vote will be given to you. And then the other three students will present and then the option will be given again. It will all be compiled uh, at the end and we will be able to announce a winner and a second place winner. So I would like to start by introducing our judges. So um, first we have Frolata Jokumsen, who's a professor at the Technical University of Denmark in Denmark. Uh, she's somebody that I've heard of for many, uh, many meetings and uh, I know she's a very uh, upstanding scientist in her field. So I'm really pleased that we can have her here. We also have David Johnson a lead scientist at CALCIC incorporated in the USA. Of course, CALCIC is a very important uh, manufacturer of ingredients and antioxidants. So we're um, glad to have you, David. And then finally, Nora Young, who's the director of taste and sensory innovation, also at CALCIC is with us. So she'll bring a really interesting perspective to the judging. So I would like to introduce the uh, First student. Before I do that, I guess I should mention that there will, there should be a Google spreadsheet, and you will be able to enter questions for the students, which they can then have a chance to answer. So the first presenter today will be Siu Zhang, the University of Georgia in the USA, and uh, he is a our CU is a postdoctorate researcher at uh, University of Georgia, just recently graduated with a PhD in food science. We'll be speaking about lipase assisted production of 1O glycerol characterization and its antioxidant properties. Dr. Zhang? Hi. Hi everyone. Today I'll talk. I'll be talking about the characterization and characterization and its antioxidant properties about the uh, of a new uh, compound we synthesize one O galoeuglisol. It's been synthesized using lipase as uh, lipase assisted production, and one O galoeuglisol, as you can see here, the structure is shown right here. It's a ester between uh, gallic acid and the glycerol. Based on its structure, it should be readily soluble in aqueous media, but although it hasn't been tested yet before this work, and it can be easily transformed to a to lipid to a lipid lipophilic form uh, using the free, two free hydroxyl groups from the glycerol, and some studies showing it has better antioxidant properties than propylgallate and butylated hydroxytoluene, and animal studies suggest. Is, it doesn't have a, a chronic adverse health effects. It's also a natural component from of many plants. Uh, in our previous work, we have produced produce this compound through enzymatic transesterification in small scale, but for but to characterize it and for industrial applications, large scale synthesis is needed. And here's a reaction scheme 
basically is a glycolysis between propylgallate uh, and the glycol. We use a 100 mil double layer jacket reactor for the reaction. And the liposome 435 was used as a biocatalyst. And for the characterization and determination is of its antioxidant properties, uh, we use the UV, UV with spectral photo, photometry. We also determine the log P and the log D value of this compound in uh, water and N-octanol. We also determine its water solubility. For the antioxidant property, we use four common antioxidant in vitro antioxidant acids, including DPPH, uh, ABTS, FRAP, and hydrogen peroxide scavenging acids. And here's our results. In the, the dry lines are showing the yield and hydrolysis in our small scale, in our previous small scale synthesis. Uh, because we because this one is a scale up reaction, the uh, the heat transfer may be changed. So we re optimize the temperature. Showing in here, uh, fifty five should uh, should the highest uh, yield and the, about the same level of the hydrolysis than fifty than fifty and, and sixty. So we should fifty five as the optimal reaction temperature. And here's the characterization data for this compound. The uh, UV with absorption peaks are basically the same for uh, one or gallo-eugliosyl gallic acid and propyl gallate. Uh, the, co the extinction coefficient are almost, uh, almost the same, but the water solubility of one or gallo-eugliosyl increased significantly after the modification. And it's, it has the lowest log P value, which means it's most hydrophilic, uh, it's most hydrophilic among three compounds. And the antioxidant property determined using four common acids. In, in, in the FRAP and hydrogen peroxide acid, one or gallo eugliosyl should uh, highest antioxidant property. In, in the DPPH and ABTS acid, one or gallo eugliosyl and gallic acid should similar antioxidant property, which, still, which is higher than propylgallate. So, that one or gallo eugliosyl maybe uh, ex maybe maybe can be used as a, a re uh, antioxidant alternative to gallic acid or palate. And here's the conclusion: a water soluble gal uh, gallic acid derivative has been produced enzymatically in large scale. One or gallo eugliosyl has been fully characterized. In vitro antioxidant acid suggests one or this compound may have better antioxidant property the gallic acid and propyl gallate. And here's my references. Thank you. Now I'm ready for questions. Thank you, see you. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, you briefly flashed your reaction conditions on the screen. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't catch though. Did you carry this reaction uh, without water, without a solvent, or did you just mix the reactants, or did you have to use a solvent to keep them? Oh, this reaction is use a uh, glycer as both solvent and substrate. We didn't add any extra solvent in it. Okay. Solvent free condition. I like that. Are you able to tell us which enzyme you used? Uh, we use a uh, food grade immobilized Canada and Antarctica lab is speed liposome 435. <laughs> uh, that's a very good enzyme. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, judges, do you have a question for CU? CU, I, I can start it off. I have a question for you. Why do you think the antioxidant activity increased in the GG mm -hmm. component? Um, it seemed like it had a similar structure, at least the starting structure is propyl gallate. It uh, could be due to the change of the uh, solubility after the modification. This one certainly is more uh, hydrophilic. So maybe the uh, increased uh, solubility in those 
all those acids, all those in vitro acids are carried out in water or in methanol. So the increased solubility could somehow enhance the antioxidant ability. Thank you. So, so I have a question. So you did a great uh, study of synthesized the uh, water soluble antioxidants. So I'm curious about your next step. So you already proved it's better than the other counterparts. So what's next? Uh, now we are testing it in bulk oil and oil in water emulsion. We, we already tested in a fish oil and soybean oil, maybe testing it's more oil. And for synthesis wise, we are, we are doing like, uh, because the two actual free hydroxy group from the blister, we are Try, uh, we are modifying it to a lipophilic form, saying uh, to say if there's a lipophilic derivative, maybe has like a better solubility in oil or like a better antioxidant ability. We are going to test that. So in bulk oils, you're not testing GG only. You're testing the modified GG with uh, lipophilic properties. Uh, we are going to test the lipophilic form of it, but we already test the GG. It should better antioxidant properties. Uh, also than propylgallate and the acid. In, in bulk oils? Yeah. But it's water soluble, so how do you do the dispersion? Uh, uh, it's water soluble, but it can also be soluble in bulk oil as a low concentration. We test it only at 100 ppm, so sort of low concentration. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Well, then I can follow up with one more question. And first of all, thank you for a very nice and uh, clear presentation. Um, uh, my question is, uh, did you do any purification? I mean, after the synthesis? Yes. You, you probably purified. So, so which technique did you use? Uh, we use uh, liquid liquid extraction. Uh, we were trying we were trying to like purify in a in a larger quantity than column chromatography. So instead of traditional chromatography, we were using liquid liquid extraction using uh, acyl acid to extract it from the mixture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, judges. I believe that's the end of our questions. Thank you, see you. Thank you. And um, we will now transfer to our next speaker. Our next student to present will be Giovanna Carlini. She's at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She'll be speaking to us today about the chemical characterization of Eschian plantaginium seed oil obtained by three methods of extraction. Giovanna. Okay. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Giovanna. Thank you for watching this presentation. I will present the work done in the Laboratory of Functional Foods Development about the chemical characterization of acute seed oil obtained by three methods of extraction. Acute plantaginium has been considered an important alternative source of omega-3 to marine oils due to the high proportion of stardonic acid and different processes of seed oil extract can affect the chemical, physical, functional, and sensory characteristics of the oil. Therefore, um, the objective of this study is to determine the chemical and sensory parameters um, of acute plantaginium, 
uh, seed oil submitted to three different extraction techniques, hydraulic press, continuous screw press, and solvent extraction. And then 30% of this solvent oil was mixed with 70% of the press oil, um, providing so the blend sample that we use it in the work. The analysis made until this moment were MDA and tocopherol by high performance liquid chromatography and peroxide value by spectrophotometer, phenolic composition by high resolution mass spectrometry, and finally the sensory analysis by the structured hedonic scale. Peroxide value and MDA analysis were used to evaluate the oxidative stability of the oils. Um, the blend sample obtained high peroxide, peroxide values. And even they were high, they were below the legal limit for the consumption of the crude oils. In the MDA results, the hydraulic sample um, had higher values than press and blend samples. And the tocopherol values were high in the press samples. And the hydraulic and the blend samples used their natural antioxidant, the tocopherol, during the oxidation process stimulated by its extraction methods. Um, however, tocopherol was not enough to stop the oxidation process of the samples. And we can see this mainly in hydraulic sample that produced the secondary oxidation product, the MDA, then oxidized more compared to the other samples. And this was due to a long time of manual extraction, leaving a long period in contact, in contact with oxygen. And the press sample, press sample obtained um, higher levels of tocopherol. And this can, can be explained by the um, low time and temperature during the extraction process, maintaining the um, tocopherol and having low levels of oxidation. Um, the sensory characteristics were similar in all the samples. However, um, due to the acceptability being somewhat reduced, it was pointed out that the greenish color of the oil, when compared to other oils, um, had a negative point in this acceptance. And as a partial conclusion, um, we can see that the extraction methods can influence the chemical characteristics of the oils. But these chains were not enough to modify the acceptance between them. And looking at all aspects, we can, can conclude that the continuous screw press can be considered the best extraction option as it had better oxidative stability and higher levels of tocopherol compared to the other oils. And this, thank you for watching. Thank you, Giovanna. That was very interesting. I like the practical aspect of comparing these different uh, extraction methods. And of course, it does occur that some oils are considered, a, a darker color is actually considered a benefit, like olive oil or avocado oil. Uh, it looks more authentic if it's green. So I have a question here. Uh, when you did your pressing, did you use a press aid like added cellulose or cotton or hulls or some other material that went into with the seeds to make it more effective in the press? 
No, it's only the seeds. I put only the seeds. It's only to test the, um, the method with nothing more. It's the method. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I didn't put anything. Thank you. Uh, judges, would you like to ask some questions? Yeah, I can, I can start off this time. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for a, a very clear presentation. Um, so I was wondering uh, when you did the sensory evaluation, was that performed by a trained panel or was it a consumer yep. panel? So no, no training. Consumer. Of the Consumers. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Because that, that's, that's good when you, when you use the hedonic scale, you should, it should be by a consumer panel. So that's good. Uh, so as a second question is uh, you evaluated, I would say it was the oxi oxidative uh, status, uh, but not really the stability of the oil because it was just, you know, one value after you have done the extraction as, as far as I understood. So are you going to study the stability uh, over time of these three different uh, extractions or blends? No, it's uh, the, um, the object is to evaluate when I finish the, um, the method, the extraction. And now, for now, I won't do this. But okay. maybe in another work, yes, I want to continue. It's, uh, I have low time <laughs> to finish. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one question for you, Giovanna, would be, why do you think that the peroxide value and the MDA value were conflicting for the hydraulic press? They were, they were flipped between the two. Because the peroxide is the first product of the oxidation. And so the MDA is the second. So they changed it. It's, um, oxidized more, so the peroxide turn on uh, the, um, the MJ. Okay. It's because of this. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, one more question. So why did you compare the two pressed oil samples with the blend, not the 100% hexane extracted oil? Why did you blend it? Because the industry used the blend sample to yield the extraction of the oil. So they don't um, sell only the solvent oil, they sell the blend oil. Because when they use the um, press and has some oil in the cake yet, that's not um, take all the oil up from the seeds. So the, that produce a cake that has oil and they use the solvent extraction to take off to take them the rest of the oil and they blend to yield this i end it's because of that that they use this in the industry okay makes sense thank you thank you thank you giovanna it was very uh, interesting talk so uh we will now switch. Okay, thank you. Next, so, hello everyone. Next, we will hear from Susan Khalifa at Tohoku University in Japan. She will be presenting on exposure of squalene hydroperoxides to photons causes the formation of unique squalene cyclic peroxides by a chain reaction mechanism detected on the human skin and causing harm to skin cells. Susan? Yes, so thank you very much for introducing me. And thank you everyone for joining in. So without further ado, I will start my presentation 
about squalene of the cycloperoxides, their detection on the human skin, and their effect on skin cells. So to begin with, our skin is the first barrier that separates us and that protects us from the external environment. And our skin is coated with a layer of lipids that plays an overall protective role. However, when these lipids are exposed to sunlight and to other environmental stressors, they undergo oxidative modifications to form uh, harmful oxidation products. So if we look at the composition of these lipid species on our skin, we will find that squalene accounts for 12% of total skin surface lipids, so which makes it the most abundant skin surface lipid. And it has been already demonstrated that when our skin is exposed to photons, for example, sunlight, the photosensitizers that we have on our skin, they transform the triplet state molecular oxygen, which is the oxygen found in the air, to singlet oxygen, which is a very reactive form of oxygen. So when this singlet oxygen is formed, it reacts with squalene and it attacks the double bonds present on the molecule. So when it attacks the double bonds, it forms squalene monohydroperoxide isomers in the number of six isomers. So of course, the difference between the isomers is the position of the hydroperoxide group on the molecule. So these hydroperoxides are relatively unstable because of the presence of the hydroperoxide group. And since our skin is constantly exposed to sunlight and to other environmental stressors, and since SQOH, which are squalene monohydroperoxide isomers, are relatively unstable, we assumed that these squalene monohydroperoxide isomers can actually form other products when they are further exposed to photons and in the presence of triplet state molecular oxygen, which is the oxygen found in the air. So what we did next is that we synthesized pure SQOH isomers and we exposed each isomer individually to photons in the presence of triplet state molecular oxygen. The results that we found were very interesting because the uh, mechanism that was formed, uh, the mechanism that enabled the transformation of these SQOH isomers uh, proceeded by a chain reaction mechanism, and it had a pattern uh, which was compatible between each SQOH isomer. So among the cyclic peroxide species that we found, the two species, 2OH3, 1,2-dioxin SQ, and 2OH3, 7, 1,2-dioxin SQ, which are the only two cyclic peroxide species presented here, were actually detected on the human skin. Not only that, but 2OH3, 1,2-dioxin SQ, which is highlighted in a blue frame here, was actually detected inside the epidermis in the top layer, which is the stratum corneum layer. So since we saw that this compound was detected on the surface and it can penetrate the epidermis, we wanted to check its effect on skin cells. So we used keratinocytes, which are cells that make up 90% of the epidermis, and we treated these cells with 2OH3, 1,2-dioxin SQ. So when we uh, cultured these cells, we cultured both the basal phenotype of the cells and the fully differentiated uh, cells, which mimics the epidermal model of uh, human skin. So when we treated these cells with 2OH3, 1,2-dioxin SQ, we saw that there was an upregulation of keratin-1 gene, which is responsible for differentiation and keratinization. The upregulation of interleukin-8 and interleukin-1 beta was also observed, which are uh, cytokines that cause inflammation. There was also an upregulation in the COX-2 gene, which is also uh, related to inflammation. So when we used higher doses of 2OH3, 1,2-dioxin SQ, we observed a significant decrease in the viability of the cells, which means cell death. So if we look at all these symptoms, accelerated differentiation, keratinization, and induction of inflammation, also cell death. These are symptoms often observed in uh, subjects with altered skin conditions, such as psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. So these compounds, we didn't even know that we had them on our skin, and they are causing uh, significant harm to our skin cells. So subjects with skin disease might have elevated concentrations of these uh, species. It is also necessary to scan for similar compounds that can be formed from other lipid species on our skin and to find a way to stop the mechanism leading to their formation. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.
Thank you, Sasan. That looks like a very uh, complicated and difficult set of reactions to carry out. I, it is. I was, it is, yes. <laughs> I, I, so thank you. I have a question uh, here about the keratinocytes you tested with. Yes. So um, did you use cell lines that you have cultured and kept in Petri dishes or what kind of cells did you have for that? Actually, we used HACAT cells. So HACAT cells is an immortalized cell line. The reason why we use this type of cell line because it can uh, uh, maintain the same uh, expression of genes over a long period of time. Whereas mm. if we use normal cells, they have a very limited lifespan. It's about three weeks and the cells die. And the turnover of uh, gene expression during that period is very, very different. So HACAT cells mimic the uh, human living cells the best. And also because we needed to do differentiation, it's uh, better to do it on HACAT cells. So you maintain the cell line in the undifferentiated state and then you ah, differentiate yes. it, okay. Exactly, yeah. So we used higher uh, calcium levels. We maintained uh, calcium levels at a low concentration to maintain the basal phenotype. And we increased the concentration of calcium gradually to obtain the fully differentiated uh, keratinocytes. Interesting. I believe Japan is very advanced in this kind of skin research. Yes, that's, actually that's it is. Yeah. yeah, and this work actually is very hard and long. It's uh, the work of three years. This is all, yeah, because the identification of the compounds takes a lot of time, the synthesis and the, yeah. Yeah, just making those compounds had to be a challenge. Yes, it was very challenging. And the identification was the most challenging part actually. Really? Yeah, because we had to use NMR, derivatization reactions, and yeah. even chemical calculations using Spartan AT software. So it was very hard, yeah. <laughs> That's great, congratulations. Thank you. Do our judges have any questions? I can start off this time. So Susan, thank you for the very nice presentation. You made me wanting to put more sunscreen on my skin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm curious about the application implication of this uh, study. Uh, what do you think would be a solution to slow down this type of reaction except to putting more sunscreen? Actually, I think instead of putting more sunscreen, I think uh, eating food that has a lot of antioxidants will be better. Maintaining a more healthy lifestyle because there are a lot of antioxidants like vitamin E that are um, that act mainly on the skin. Because yeah, so I think maintaining a healthy lifestyle is better than putting on a lot of products. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So I can follow up with, uh, with one more question. I actually had the, the same question as Nora. Uh, but, but when you studied these uh, reactions, if I understood it correctly, where you, you, uh, you had the uh, original uh, squalene peroxides and then you did uh, the, uh, the reactions, but in, in which uh, system did you do, do okay. those reactions? So first of all, to produce squalene monohydroperoxides, I oxidized squalene using singlet oxygen. So to produce singlet oxygen, I had to use a photosensitizer. I used rose bengal. So rose bengal is a type two photosensitizer. Mm. When it's excited with light, it produces singlet oxygen from triplet state molecular oxygen. So by singlet oxygen, I produced squalene monohydroperoxide isomers. And then I uh, purified the isomers using HPLC in normal and reverse phase. And then once I obtained the pure compounds, I oxidized each isomer alone, and I saw the compounds that could be formed. But but when what was the what was the, the the system that you that you did the oxidation in? I mean, was it in a solvent? Was it in an okay. oil? Or or how so, did you do that? Yeah. So the first oxidation to produce squalene monohydroperoxides, I oxidized in ethanol because it needs okay. to proceed in protic solvents. And the second uh, oxidation to produce cyclic peroxides. Actually, it proceeds only in aprotic solvents or in a medium with no solvents, in a system with no solvent. Okay. So if you expose SQOH with light and uh, triplet state molecular oxygen, you will get cyclic peroxides. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. So then I'll kind of trail on that question is, I imagine some of these are fairly unstable. How do you stabilize them enough to be able to analyze them? I 
actually, that's surprising because uh, cyclic peroxides, I thought that they will be more unstable, but actually they were more stable than hydroperoxides. Mm. The four-membered cyclic peroxides are more unstable. So this one is a dioxin. It's a six-membered cyclic peroxide. And I found that it's relatively more stable than hydroperoxides. When I tried even to oxidize it more, it was more resistant. Wow. So for hydroperoxides, I maintain them in protic solvents. Because if there is a chance of uh, deprotonation, there is always a source of protons. So I maintain them at minus 80 degrees in protic solvents, and they should be fine. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and thank you, judges. Uh, now that we have um, had our first three speakers, we will have an interval for uh, those of you who are watching to vote. There should be a vote button obvious to you. And um, we'll give that about two minutes. And actually the, the voting for group one just closed at the conclusion of the presentation. Oh. But you can view the blue right. results button to see those rankings and we'll open group two in just a moment. I don't see a blue button, but I we have Fiona Lou, so that's all that matters. I got it. Our next student to be presenting is AJ Gildkirpik. She's at the University of Illinois, which is rather close to us. The title of her talk is Evaluation of Oxidative Stability of Full Fat Soybean Flour Stored Under Accelerated Conditions as Influenced by Traditional Processing Methods. AJ, would you start? All right, thank you very much, Dr. Bloomer, for this uh, nice introduction. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited to share our latest research that we conducted as human nutrition team of USID Soybean Innovation Lab. So this has been a very terrifying year for all of us because of COVID-19, right? However, weren't you also fascinated to see our capability of creating a vaccine less than a year to address a significant pandemic that has killed millions of people in everywhere? But do you know what else is also killing millions of people in a year? That is malnutrition. It is amazing what we can do when we have a shared problem and we still have this shared problem of dealing with malnutrition, more specifically undernourishment in low income settings. One of the most common forms of malnutrition seen in children is stunting, which refers to a child who is too short for his or her age. According to the latest report of WHO, UNICEF and the World Bank Group, in 2019, over 57 millions of stunted kids lived in Africa which is the only region where the number of stunted children has increased. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the prevalence of the stunting in children under the age of five is almost 33%, meaning that one in every three kids are suffering from stunting. For the most part, the stunting in Africa is associated with the poverty, as well as the limited access to high protein and nutrient dense foods and specific minerals such as iron and zinc. One of the best sources of high quality protein are soybeans, which are cost-effective and valuable agricultural products. Therefore, they carry a great potential to combat malnutrition, especially protein deficiency in Sub-Saharan Africa. Soybeans have been used in this region. However, despite its rich nutrient composition, only a small portion of the produced soybeans is used directly for human consumption and made it into food products. While the majority of the soybeans produced for their oil content the soybean meal left after the oil extraction is dried and sold for animal feed. Though full fat soy flour is easier to obtain, the ability to use it as an ingredient is limited because of its tendency to lipid oxidation. Due to its unsaturated fatty acid composition, the 
full fat soy flour products experience reduced shelf life, especially when they're exposed to high temperature and relative humidity conditions, which are the norms in these local markets in this region. So pretreatment methods such as germination and roasting and the storage conditions within enough time can actually alter the oxidative stability of the pet containing foods, such as soybean flour. Therefore, the hypothesis of the study was that pretreatment methods will improve the oxidative stability indicators of full fat soy flour exposed to high temperature and humidity conditions after 12 weeks of storage as compared to the control. To test our hypothesis, pretreated samples were prepared in different uh, inter uh, traditional methods by our colleagues at the University for Development Studies in Ghana, and then they were sent to the USA to be used in the study. Samples were kept in two different conditions and they were collected at every four weeks from each condition to measure various oxidative stability markers, as well as some physical attributes. Then a three-way mix ANOVA was used to evaluate the effect of pretreatment time and condition factors on these physical and chemical parameters. Our data showed that pretreatment time and condition and the triple interaction of these factors had a significant impact on all oxidative stability markers tested. Of course, exposing these pretreated samples to high temperature and humidity conditions for 12 weeks resulted in an increment on, in all markers, including pn acidin value, peroxide value, and acid value. However, roasting treatment modulated that effect. As it is also shown in this graph compared to the control group and the germination, the total change in these three indicators of oxidation was significantly higher for roasting, which is a very traditional technique that is spread all over the Africa. We have confirmed results from another research group from South Korea that this is the case, which also allow us to argue against roasting, especially when you want to store full fat soy flour under the norm conditions in sub-Saharan Africa. So can we use full fat soy flour as an alternative source of protein to improve the diets of children in sub-Saharan Africa, considering the high temperature and humidity conditions in this region? This study showed that, yes, absolutely we can. We need to properly pretreat the soybeans with the methods that can improve the oxidative stability of flour, and germination could be a change in the current technology, which has other benefits as well. With this way, the utilization of full fat soy flour for human consumption can be improved, and we can also boost the nutrition of vulnerable populations. Thank you very much. Thank you, AJ. It's great to see research that is so relevant to a pressing problem and something that um, can be used practically. I have a question here about the accelerated storage conditions. Yeah. So the question says is, is about the correlation between accelerated storage conditions and actual long term storage. Sometimes people will challenge the correlation and say, well, you really can't replicate long-term storage mm -hmm. under accelerated conditions. Something is going to go sideways. Have you seen studies where people have been able to actually test these things and compare the results? Of course. So um, thank you very much, for the, first of all, for your question. Um, so the reason that we did this accelerated condition study is, was basically to mimic the conditions in sub-Saharan Africa. So that is why we try to um, maintain the temperatures at a high temperature, like 45 Celsius and really high relative humidity around 81%. But mm. the purpose was not to do a um, shelf life study. So for okay. to be able to do that, we actually needed a third temperature uh, condition, which might be um, a chill temperature, like cold temperature or something. But our mm. purpose in this case was to force these samples to the edges of their abilities to see their differences in terms of their oxidative stability. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the judges? I have a question, AJ. 
Um, it looked like roasting, if you remove that option, it would make it more oxidatively stable. But is, is roasting contributing to other aspects, whether it's bacterial load, if it's decreasing that or digestibility? Yeah, so thank you very much for your question. It's actually a actually, um, good aspect. So roasting has been used uh, in this um, context so much because it's a relatively easier process to conduct and um, it doesn't require too many efforts. However, um, the problem with the roasting is that, as you can see, it was um, promoted the oxidation. It is, uh, there are studies that showing the heat treatment um, can help you to improve the digestibility. Um, however, um, the, that is affecting the storage stability of the product. Whereas you can actually see the same, actually better um, benefits in germ germination treatment, which, is, uh, which has been um, shown that it is improving the digestibility and also um, reducing the anti-nutrients of the soybean. So, yeah. Thank you. Very helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I, I can add one more question in the same line. So uh, uh, with this roasting, uh, would it not also impact uh, the flavor? Of and course. maybe that's uh, uh, in a, it can be both ways, either favorable or unfavorable. So do you have any uh, uh, indications on what the population prefers, what type of, or the consumers pr prefer? Of course, this is actually a great question because we actually conducted a preliminary study on this. Uh, we use these uh, pre-treated samples in a um, traditional dish in Ghana and try to see the preferences of the communities of the people over there. Um, and what we have seen is that people actually um, prefer that fermented, that um, um, sorry taste of germinated samples, the malted samples. Roasting has been used and uh, the flavors, of course, the roasting is um, promoting like helping facilitating the um, sensory as well, but um, the germinated ones and the soaked samples were also preferred too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will pass this round, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll Thanks everyone. Time. Our next presentation is from Hee Bin Sao at the Sung Kyung Kwan University in the Republic of Korea. She will be presenting on antioxidant activities and chemical profiles of aqueous and ethanolic extracts from heated sesame oils in oil and water emulsion. Because this is a pre-recorded presentation, we will not have questions afterward. Hee Bin? Hello, I'm Hee Bin So, who will present about chemical profiles of heated sesame meat extract and antioxidant activities in oil and water immersion. Sesame meal is a byproduct of sesame oil processing. It is usually used as cattle feed, fertilizer, or just to discard it. Because sesame has lignan compounds, sesame oil, and tocopherol that can act as antioxidants, there is a need of increasing the value of sesame meal as antioxidants. Oily water immersion is a form of dispersed oil in water by emulsifier and homogenization process. Previous studies analyzed the antioxidant activities of sesame and sesame meal in bulk oil. In this study, chemical profiles of sesame meal extracts and antioxidant activity in oily water emergence were investigated. Materials and methods are as follows. First, preparation of sesame meal extracts. The fatted sesame meal was heat treated at 140 and 170 degrees Celsius for an hour. Sesame meal was extracted by distilled water and 70% ethanolic solution. After extraction, all extracts were freeze dried using freeze dryer. 
Oil remote thermal zone consists of cone oil and 20 emulsifier in, P in distilled water and pH buffer. Sesame milk extracts and TBHQ were added to the ML zone and stored at 50 degrees Celsius at until 2 weeks. Chemical profiles of sesame milk extracts were detected by GCMS and HPSC PD8. GCMS analysis was conducted after the herbatization, bioxymation, and trimethylation. To analyze the oxidative stability of voiding water emulsion, change of headspace oxygen content was evaluated. And the next session is result and discussion. By GCMS analysis, carbohydrates, amino acid, and uh, organic acid and lignan compounds were detected. The, the chromatogram is analysis result of sesame meal ethanol extract with no heat treatment. Carbohydrates such as sucrose and beta gantobios were the most quantified compounds in sesame meal extract. Nine amino acid and its derivatives were detected. Organic acids such as oxalic, malic, and citric acid were found more in aqueous extracts than in ethanolic extracts. Sesamine and sesamolin are lignan compounds of sesame. Lignan compounds and sesamol are the regions of high oxidative stability of sesame oil. There was a decrease of sesamine and sesamolin concentration when heating temperature increased. On the other hand, sesame concentration increased as heating temperature increased. This is because sesame is formed from sesame by thermal and exit treatment. The following is the effect of sesame meat extract on the oxidative stability of boiling water immersion. The antioxidant activities of sesame meat extract increased as heating temperature increased. In emulsions with different pH, extract shows better antioxidant activities and improve the oxidative stability of emulsion and alkaline conditions than an acidic pH. Of all the, ex all the results, ethanolic extracts had better antioxidant properties than aqueous extracts. In conclusion, chemical compounds and antioxidant activities of sesame meat extracts were influenced by heat treatment. After heat treatment, concentration of sesame increased, so the antioxidant activities of sesame meat extracts in oil and water immersion improved. Therefore, heat treated sesame meal can be used as a natural antioxidant in oil and water immersion metrics. Thank you for listening and watching this presentation. Thank you, Hibin. Our next speaker and our last speaker is Paula Albendia. She's a student at the University of Barcelona in Spain and will be speaking about effect of feeding olive pomace acid oil on the lipid composition and oxidative stability of chicken and pork meat. Paula? Hello to everyone. I would like to start this presentation with a short background. So, for the meat industry, it is really important to reduce cost, but also it is mandatory to guarantee the meat quality. One of the ways to reduce cost is searching for alternative fat sources in animal feeding. This is the case of acid oils, which are fat byproducts coming from edible oil refining with similar fatty acid composition to the crude oil. So, the aim of this work was to answer the next question. Has the inclusion of olive pomace oil, which is the crude oil, and olive pomace acid oil, which is the fat byproduct, in feeds any significant effects on lipid composition and oxidative stability of chicken meat and pork? To answer this question, we performed two different studies, one of them in pigs and the other one in chicken. In both cases, we use three dietary treatments, one of them with crude palm oil, other one with crude olive pomace oil, and the last one with olive pomace acid oil. The type of meat samples taken in the case of chickens were legs with skin, and in the case of pigs were loin. 
We perform the analysis in friends and also in refrigerated samples. And the parameters we consider in lipid composition were fatty acid composition and tocopherol and tocotrienol content, which as vitamin E compounds have antioxidant properties. And for oxidative stability evaluation, we perform thiobarbituric acid values determination. Here in this graph, we can see the fatty acid composition results. We observe significant difference among the dietary treatments in chicken meat and in pork. This is in concordance with the fat used in each case. For example, the palm has the highest saturated fatty acid percentage in both types of meat. Here in this table, we can see the tocopher and tocotrienol total content. We also found significant difference among the dietary treatments in chicken meat and in pork. And the refrigeration storage with us the tocopherol and tocotrienol total content in the case of olive pomas acid oil in pork, as we can see here in this part of the table. To finish with the results, here in this graph, we have the thiobarbituric acid values represented as manoldialdehyde, manoldialdehyde concentration, which is the main secondary oxidation product. We found significant difference among the dietary treatments in all cases, being olive pomas acid oil, the one with the highest TBA values. The refrigeration increased the TBA levels in both types of meat. So the answer to our question is yes. The inclusion of olive pomas oil and olive pomas acid oil has a significant effect in lipid composition and oxidative stability in chicken meat and in pork. So the inclusion, the use of these two fat allows us to produce meats with lower content of saturated fatty acids. Based on the oxidation results, we will say that in the case of pork, it will be preferable to use olive pomas oil instead of olive pomas acid oil. But in the case of chicken, we could use both types of fat indistinctly. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Paula. I, I enjoyed your presentation. It's very interesting. Of course, olive pomace oil is a undervalued material, especially the acid oil. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see this being successfully applied in animal diets. Uh, there's a question here about the animal's preferences for the feed. Did you notice uh, were you were you part of feeding the the animals, or had you just did you just get the meat and and analyze that, or what was your role? Well, uh, here these few studies uh, we collaborate with one company, which ah. is Bonaria, so we didn't feed the the animals. It's a strange thing with animals because they seem to like things that we don't like. So I was curious to see about that. Um, do our judges have some questions? Well, I have a question. I, yeah, go ahead. Go, okay, I'll go ahead then. Uh, so what, what was the, or can you explain the differences that you uh, observed in uh, the levels of oxidation? What, 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 what was the mechanism behind that, do you think? Well, uh, we have to perform more studies in oxidation stability because we, use also a ferrous oxidation silenol method. So I think that maybe the conclusions, uh, we are going to get them uh, after this type of analysis. Also, we are going to analyze the volatile compounds. But uh, here, I think that um, the most, uh, the most uh, important thing is that in the case of chicken, we have a 
levels, lower levels of oxidation than in the case of pork. But um, this could be due to maybe to a lower uh, tocopherol content or maybe because uh, uh, other things that we have to study. Hmm. Okay, thank you. A yeah, question in the refrigerated pork, the, the olive pumice um, performed noticeably better in terms of oxidation stability compared to the OPA, um, but they had a similar fatty acid profile. What do you think is causing the, the better performance of the, the olive pumice compared to the OPA? Is it the tocopherol content or is it something else? Mm, well, uh, it could be the tocopherol and tocotrienol content because in the case of uh, olive pumice acid oil, we could see, we can see that the tocopherol and tocotrienol in the meat was lower in this dietary treatment. But also maybe when we perform this uh, analysis, uh, the same I, I have just said, maybe we could uh, reach to more, uh, more conclusions. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. I have a question about the OP and OPA. It seems mm -hmm. in chicken, no matter fresh or refrigerated, compared to OP, OPA significantly increased the tocopherols and the tocotrienols concentration, but in pork, it's totally, it's opposite. So what is driving this difference? Yes, well, one of the important thing of the acid oils is one, one of the drawbacks is the variability in the composition of between two batches from the same olive from the same sub by, by product with the same process so maybe uh, this difference could be due, due to this uh, composition composition of uh, op and opa uh, yes, between chicken, because the first idea in this study was to perform the two studies with the same batch of fats, but due to technical problems, we couldn't do this, so we have to perform with different uh, batches. So maybe uh, the chemical composition of olive pomace acid oil in the case of chicken is different to the olive pomace acid oil in the case of, of pork. All right, thank you. So you have the fatty acids composition of the chicken and the fat. Do you also have a uh, analysis data to show the difference between OP and OPA? Uh, yes, uh, yes. The thing here in the poster and in the presentation, I only saw the I I only put in the fatty acid composition of the meat, but I uh, we also analyze the fat and the feed. And the difference could be in, in some parameters as moisture, impurities, and unsaponifiable content. So maybe it's not in the fatty acid composition, but it's in the relation between prooxidant and antioxidant of the okay. fat. Understandable. You have only limited space to put uh, selected data onto it. So is it possible, like maybe by memory, what is the biggest the difference, uh, chemical comp composition difference between OP and OPA? Well, I, I think that in the case of chicken meat, we are talking about uh, uh, moisture impurity and unsaponifiable quantity, the total of uh, 6% in the case of chicken. And in the case of pork, we are talking about uh, 12%, more or less. I don't remember exactly, but more or less. These are the quantities. All right, thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now our judges and uh, our students will go offline while the, uh, they discuss the uh, students' performance here today. And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes uh, to talk about to announce those results. In, in the interim, I would like to tell you about other items on the agenda here in the AOCS annual meeting. I believe the judges can turn off their webcams. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. there will be 
a session called The Action of Catalysts and Antioxidants in Lipid Oxidation. This is uh, going to be at 4 p.m. to 6.35. Another session uh, Friday morning will be Antioxidant Applications. That will be chaired by David Johnson, who's one of our judges here today. Uh, also Friday, later in the afternoon, there'll be a session called Contemporary Analysis of Lipid Oxidation Products, Detecting and Quantitating More Products at Lower Levels. This will be at 4 p.m. Next week on Monday, there will be a session, Lipid Oxidation in Interesterified Fats and Oils and New Oil Products. This will be chaired by Dilip Nakasi, who is a former member of the AOCS Governing Board and a good friend. On Tuesday, there'll be a session, Lipid Oxidation Variation with Specific Food Matrices at 4 p.m. That will be chaired by Forlate Jakobsen, who is one of our judges here today. So we're, um, these people are working very hard to uh, make this program succeed. On Wednesday evening, 7 p.m., there'll be a session called Lipid Oxidation in Omega-3 Products, and David Johnson will be chairing that one as well. Thursday at 4 p.m., there'll be a session called Lipid Oxidation and Quality in Novel Alternative Protein Products. So this is a very uh, growing, rapidly growing area. I encourage you to attend if you can. And finally, for sessions, Friday uh, at 7 a.m., there'll be a session called Lipid Oxidation in Frying, Updates and New Perspectives. In addition, next Wednesday, you're all invited to join the mixer for this division. This will be at 10 a.m. next Wednesday. That's 10 a.m. Chicago time. Our judges have spoken. Our second place winner today is AJ Kalpernik, uh, Gulkirpik, sorry AJ, from the University of Illinois. And our first place winner is Susan Khalifa from Tohoku University in Japan. So thank you very much for participating to all of you. And um, they were very good presentations, so. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much.